that I found is a little bit sad, even though it's a little bit sad. Depression among law students is eight to nine percent prior to matriculation, but 27 percent after one semester, 34 percent after two semesters, and 40 percent after three semesters, or after three years. Stress among law students is 98 percent compared to 70 percent in medical school and 43 percent for other graduate schools. Depression and anxiety is cited by 26% of all lawyers. So mental health issues are a serious issue in our profession, and we're grateful to have people here to talk to us about these issues today. I want to first welcome John Broderick to Vermont Law School. Mr. Broderick is the Senior Director of External Affairs at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and served as the Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. For the past 45 months, he has traveled throughout New Hampshire and Vermont on a mission to change the culture and conversation around mental illness in an effort to destigmatize it. He says it is the most important work he has done in his entire professional life. I also want to uh, introduce Attorney General T.J. Donovan. T.J. Donovan is a Vermonter uh, who serves as Vermont's uh, Attorney General. He started his career as a district attorney in Philadelphia, and he has, was the Chittenden State's attorney for 10 years. So let's give TJ and John a warm welcome. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully it works. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes? You may grow to regret that, but now it sounds okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my cousin for being here. I haven't seen Maria in a while. She's here. I was shocked. Her daughter works here now at the law school. Uh, I want to thank the law school for inviting me here today. And I want to thank the Attorney General of your state, who I've come to know now, and who's a big supporter of this effort. He's a pretty incredible person. When I finish, you'll hear from the Attorney General. And we were told we had to be done talking around 5 o'clock. I hope <laughs> maybe I got that wrong. No, I won't do that to you. But uh, I'm here today for a very simple reason. I need your help. That's why I'm here. For the last 45 months, I've been traveling around northern New England mostly, speaking wherever I'm asked to take away the shame, the stigma, and the shadows around mental illness, because we need to. You guys know that, too. It's way past time, by the way. I grew up in a town. I'm a baby boomer. You couldn't have guessed that, I'm sure. But I grew up in a town uh, north of Boston, <clears throat> very middle-class town. Had 20,000 people in the town when I was a kid. And every person in my town had perfect mental health. Isn't that amazing? And every marriage in my town was happy, too. I actually believed that for a while. I lived in that bubble. I don't live in that bubble now. My dad was a high school science teacher. My mother wanted to be a nurse, but her family couldn't have afforded that. And she worked in an office in the neighboring town. And my best friend, when I was 10 years old, lived right across the street from my house, and his father was a graduate of MIT. In my childhood, in my neighborhood, MIT was rock star status. My friend's uncle, his father's brother, never graduated from high school. He was an inpatient at the Danvers Mental Hospital in Danvers, Massachusetts. Every adult who ever circled that place, and every kid, including me, we used to call it the nut house. You must have thought that was funny. Nobody was embarrassed to say that, by the way. Nobody was ashamed to say that. I, I certainly wasn't. And in the summertime, often on a Sunday, my friend's father would pick his brother up at the nut house and bring him to their house across the street. I was 10 years old. I can still see that man standing by their garage looking at the flowers sometimes walking around the yard. He never looked at me, never spoke to me, never gestured to me. But on those warm Sundays, I never had the courage to leave the safety of my front yard. That's how I viewed it, by the way. 
I never had the courage to leave the safety of my front yard to play with my friend. I just didn't. And I knew even as a kid, since everyone in my town had perfect mental health, that I would never know anyone or see anyone again the rest of my life who had a mental health problem. I was pretty sure of that. And I was wrong about that. It's one of the reasons I've devoted a lot of my waking hours with the help of Dartmouth Hitchcock over the last 45 months, speaking wherever I'm asked. I'm on a mission, and I need your help. Some decades after that childhood I described in a different state, namely New Hampshire, in a different community, Manchester, and on a street somewhat different than the one I grew up on, mental illness crossed that road from my childhood and took up residence in my own house. My wife and I are baby boomers. We didn't know anything about mental illness. Maybe at the extreme we could spot it, but that was it. We're baby boomers, and for most of my childhood and much of my adult life, nobody talked about it. It just didn't come up. It wasn't polite. So we were pretty ignorant. But it was in my house, and it was growing. I had two sons, 11 and 13. They took our residence in my 13-year-old son. He didn't know he had a mental health problem, and it makes sense when you think about it. How would you know that? It's just how you feel, how you respond to other people or circumstances. But he was suffering. He just thought it was him, and we didn't see it. When my son graduated from the eighth grade, it was on a Saturday, as I recall, he woke up that day and told my wife and I he didn't want to go to his graduation. We thought he was just lazy, it was summer, he wanted to be out of school for good. And that wasn't why, by the way, but we wouldn't know it for a long time. And so he went to his graduation, he wasn't happy about it. He was a really terrific artist, my son, and so he spent a lot of time in his bedroom at his desk with the door closed, drawing. Today I would describe it as withdrawing, but I was pretty ignorant about mental illness back then. I'm not ignorant now, by the way. I'm not ignorant now. My son started smoking in the ninth grade. I didn't know that. He kept that pretty well hidden. He went to Trinity High School in Manchester, and he had friends at the school, but not nearly as many as his younger brother, who was few years behind him. When my son graduated from high school, if you look at the yearbook, you'll find his photograph with every other graduate. But if you look through the high school yearbook and the candid shots at the football games, the dances, the school plays, you won't see him in those shots because he wasn't at those places. He was probably home drawing or withdrawing. I see it now. I see it now. He did okay in high school, not as well as I thought he could have. I always thought he was smarter than his grades, but he always tested well. Always tested well. And he got into a pretty good college in New York, and then off he went. And I don't know if it's a rumor, maybe it's true, you guys might know, but I've heard that sometimes when kids go to college, they drink. Have you heard that? <laughs> it could be true. And sadly, with my son, it was true. I remember him calling some of those early months on a Sunday from New York, and I could detect it in his speech. It was pretty alarming to hear it, and I talked to him about it, and he would say, Dad, I don't have a drinking problem. We really don't need to talk about it. Over time, would be on that campus, eventually his friends, who we didn't know, the students there would seek us out, my wife and I, and express their concerns about his drinking. I talked to my son about it. He'd say, Dad, I, I don't know why they say that. I, I don't drink more than anybody else here. I thought he must have, but I couldn't prove it or disprove it. He looked a lot more disheveled as time passed than I remembered him when he was home. But I just chalked it up to having the freedom being away for the first time. That wasn't why, by the way, but I didn't know that then. My son got a college degree. Knowing what I know now, I'm in awe of him. 
I don't know how he did that. He must have willed himself to that degree. And he had done okay at college, not great, not as well as he could have, but he tested well. He got into a pretty good graduate school in Boston, and then he came home. He was living with my wife and me in Manchester and commuting three days a week to classes. And once he was home with us, it was pretty obvious he was drinking pretty much every day. He tried to hide it, tried to flip his life so we wouldn't notice, but it was hard to do that. He was going to school three days a week. We talked to him about his drinking, and he just didn't want to do that. We don't need to keep talking about it. I don't have a drinking problem. We must have talked about it too much because he moved north of Boston to finish his degree. He got a master's degree. Knowing what I know now, I have no idea how he did that. And when he graduated with his master's degree, he got a job pretty quickly, which wasn't surprising. I mean, he's really smart. I mean, really smart. He can talk to you about Mookie Betts, or he can talk to you about Aristotle, not because he's read about Aristotle, but because he's read Aristotle. One of the best read people I've ever known. He's a self-taught musician. He writes music. He's a terrific artist. He's funny. So it wasn't a shock that he got a job quickly, but it was a shock. It only lasted a month. It wasn't his fault, he said. He lost the job. The next job took longer to get and lasted for less time. It wasn't his fault, he said. He lost the job. And then he was back living with us in New Hampshire. He was drinking pretty much every day, trying to hide it. He took graphic design classes wherever he could. He always excelled at those. But he had long periods of not working, or hourly rate jobs, or part-time jobs. And he couldn't see that was a problem. What seemed obvious to us, he didn't see. After a while, my wife and I reached out to the alcohol experts and told them what I've told all of you. And, and they didn't hesitate, by the way. They said, your son, a judge, is an alcoholic. That's what's going on here. And you and your wife better deal with that. And so my wife and I, for a while, went to Al-Anon meetings for family members of alcoholics. My son thought that was ridiculous. Dad, I am not an alcoholic. If I didn't have these feelings, Dad, I wouldn't be drinking. We'd mention that to the alcohol people. They didn't hesitate on that either. Judge, every alcoholic will tell you they have a reason they drink. He's an alcoholic. And so, at the end of the day, you and your wife are going to have to make a choice, and here it is. You can either put him out of your house, literally out, or, and hope he hits bottom, turns his life around, or you can let him stay in your house, and he's going to die drinking there. Not tomorrow, next week, or next year, but you can't drink like he's drinking and have a long life. And my wife and I didn't like that choice. And so... We convinced my son, who didn't have an alcohol problem, according to him, to go to alcohol rehab. I realize how silly that is now, but it was better than making that choice. And then my son did the world tour of alcohol rehab. New Hampshire, Connecticut, Hyannis, Massachusetts, and Florida. And my wife and I were praying for a miracle that he would have some insight on his drinking. I picked him up after he'd been in Florida for weeks. I met him in Logan Airport, and as he and I were walking to the baggage claim, he said, Dad, I had a drink on the plane on the way home, but I don't have a drinking problem. So I hadn't taken. Now, his brother had gotten his master's degree, had gotten married, was moving ahead with his life. His older brother couldn't go to his wedding because he'd been drinking. It was a really hard time in my house. And we believed that we must have failed him somehow. His younger brother was doing fine, but he was not. I was on the Supreme Court in New Hampshire at the time. I'd drive every day from Manchester, where we lived, to Concord, where the court was. And I'd be thinking, what did we do wrong? How did we fail him? Eventually, my wife and I had to make that decision. They told us we'd have to make. 
And my wife's not here today, so I'm not trying to look good in her eyes. Not that I'm opposed to that. I'm just not doing it right now. But my wife is really a lovely person, kind and generous, a really good person. And we loved our son, and we wanted to do the right thing. And it looked like the only thing we could do was put him out. And so we did. My son was living in his car, sleeping in his car. Some nights he slept at the shelter in Manchester, went to the soup kitchen when he was eating. He continued to drink. And after three weeks of that agony and dreading that phone call that no parent wants to get, and in my son's case, it might have been involved driving drunk and hitting another family, and we just couldn't do that. And so we brought him home, knowing what they told us it would mean, but we were still holding out for a miracle. And when he came home, he was drinking just as much as when we had put him out. And knowing what I know now about his mental illness, I'm sure when we put him on the sidewalk, he thought we had thrown him away. And he was probably fearful we'd put him out again. He knew he couldn't go back out. And so one night he'd been drinking and he assaulted me. I went to the intensive care unit in a hospital in Manchester. I was in the ICU for six or eight days. I, I have no memory of that. But my wife does. I don't know how she survived that. My master's educated son was arraigned in a public courtroom in front of a lot of press. It was a man by his dog story. Issued an orange jumpsuit and went to the Valley Street Jail in Manchester. Let me tell you something, you never want to go to the Valley Street Jail. You don't want to go there if your father's a judge, I can tell you that. I wasn't really popular at the jail. You can imagine. But I didn't know any of that then, but my wife did. She said it was all over the news in New Hampshire. The Attorney General had a live press conference on television to talk about it. They wrote about it in the Los Angeles Times and New York Times. My doctors went on the Today Show when I was in the ICU. I didn't know that. My wife said for the first three days at the hospital would be satellite trucks outside. It was late March, early April, kind of dreary. She'd go out at side door, home, and she said there'd be 20 messages every day. She'd erase them all. What would I have said to people? What would I have told them? She visited my son at the Valley Street Jail when I was in the ICU. I don't know how she did that. I can't imagine what that was like for her or for him. They talked on a telephone with plexiglass between them. He had his orange jumpsuit on, his ankles were shackled. He said, Mom, is Dad okay? I can't believe I did that to Dad. Just tell me he's going to be okay. I can never forgive myself. In the early days, she didn't know. He said, Mom, they don't allow visits here very often, but on the days that you can't come visit, if you went to the street corner by the cemetery that I can see from my cell window, I would at least be able to see you, and I would know my family hadn't abandoned me. And so my wife, by herself, would drive at the appointed hour to that street corner. It was a dreary time of year. She said, I'd park the car and I'd wave at the jail, multiple stories, and give them a thumbs up. She said, I didn't know what floor, what window, or even if she was looking out. And she said, I'd drive home. I'd cry all the way home. I didn't know any of that. After about six or eight days, I was being wheeled down a corridor at the hospital. I said to the fellow, what am I doing in the hospital? He said, I think you fell, Judge. I had no memory of that, but I felt pretty sore. So I just accepted it. And then they brought me up to this large room on the top floor. And by the way, when you visit people in the hospital, try not to say, I love your room, OK? Don't say things like that. I hated my room. Somebody came in one day, I watched through the window, which looked like a two-day march from where I was lying looked out and looked back and said, I love the view from here. Don't say things like that. <laughs> anyway, after about a day and a half in that room, I wasn't able to get out of bed, literally out. Couldn't stand up. The nurses would say, tomorrow we're going to be using the bathroom, which is like eight feet from my bed. And I would think, oh, I don't think so. 
After a day and a half, my wife and I were alone, finally. And she told me what had happened as best she knew, and I hadn't fallen. And she told me where my son was, and we just cried. I've been a judge and a lawyer my entire professional life, so I knew what it meant for him and for us and for his brother. If I had any understanding at all, it would be alcohol, when it's abused, can take people to bad places. I don't know the technical definition for hopelessness, but I know what it feels like. That's exactly what it feels like. I couldn't stand up, I couldn't go home with my wife, I couldn't call my son. I love nurses, by the way. I love nurses. They are the caring part of healthcare. God love those nurses. They talk to me at two in the morning or three in the morning. One night I said to the nurse, shouldn't you be doing something? And she said, I think I am. She was right. When I got out of the hospital, I wasn't allowed to visit my son. The court wouldn't allow it. So my wife would go by herself, and she'd come home crying every time. Eventually, friends would go in her place just to give her a break. Friends would know my son since he was very little. Finally, after six months, my son was taken one day from the jail to the basement windowless courtroom of the Superior Court in the center of town to be sentenced to the state prison. I hope you don't have that day in your life. When I was a law student, I would have bet you anything I owned or might ever do or accomplish, that could never be my family. It was on that day. My wife and I were seated in the first row of the public section. My son came in through a side door. He was wearing civilian clothing. I wouldn't see that again for years. He had a bailiff at his elbow, and he walked over towards my wife and I. I hadn't seen him. He looked great. Hadn't had a drink in six months. I stood up. There was still press there. It was still a story to somebody. He gave me a big hug. He said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I did that to you. Then he held me back to look at me. He said, just tell me you're going to be okay. I said, they tell me I'm going to be fine. And I remember saying to him that morning, if you don't quit, your mother and I won't quit. I wasn't sure I believed that, but I told him that. And then he was sentenced to seven and a half to 15 years in a state prison. I hope you don't have that morning in your life. I don't know how we all didn't pass out, to be honest. I don't know how he didn't pass out, my master's educated, funny, talented son. I was on the Supreme Court of New Hampshire at the time. 20% of my day job was reviewing appeals from the very people he'd be living with 24-7. You might imagine I wasn't really popular at the prison. I would keep you awake at 3 in the morning if it's your son. I asked to speak to him for a minute before he left and went to a conference room, my wife and I, a bailiff and a close friend, and he seemed great. I wanted to say, get your coat, let's get out of here. But we couldn't do that. After 30 days, they allow inmates to have visitors for the first time. We met in the secure psychiatric unit of the state prison. I know they do good work there, but it's not a happy place, let me tell you. Kind of clinical antiseptic feeling, a lot of clicking heels on linoleum kind of feel to it. My son wasn't housed there, but that's where the meeting took place. We met in a conference room with the head psychiatrist at the prison, two social workers, my wife and I, and my son. He looked great, by the way, and had a drink in seven months. The psychiatrist started the meeting out by saying, I've gotten to know your son over the last 30 days. I, I really like him. He seems very smart and funny. I really enjoy our talk. And we said, no, we love our son, Doctor. We're in the prison here. He said, I know that. Let me tell you what's going on here. Your son, he said, has really serious depression. He has anxiety and panic attacks that the doctor described as virtually off the charts. He said, if you had those problems, Judge, and alcohol made you feel better, even for a little bit every day, 
took away the fear and the pain, you'd be drinking too. So don't be too judgmental about it. It wasn't a good choice, he said. But it made sense to him. It just made his problems worse. And when he told us that in that place, I knew we had failed him. I should have known more. I should have known more. I thought all mental health problems were hopeless, by the way. I now know they're far from hopeless. I didn't know that then. We would visit my son twice a week. That's what they allowed. There are a lot of places you're expected to visit your master's educated child. The state prison isn't on that list. He'd come out every time we visited, give us both a big hug. And after about four months, he said to us one night, Dad, I feel different. I said, what do you mean different? He said, well, I'm sleeping through the night, Dad. I haven't done that for years. He said, my palms aren't sweating, Dad. My, I can focus, Dad. My mind's not racing like it used to. He said, I'm teaching at the prison. I said, what are they doing for you? He said, I, I see a counselor, Dad, here pretty regularly now. And I take medication at night and in the morning. I didn't know you could feel like this. I knew I'd failed him. I should have known something about mental illness. My son was married at the state prison. Anyone making wedding plans, I wouldn't choose the prison. <laughs> the only advantage of a prison wedding is the receptions are really inexpensive. <laughs> it's true, Coca-Cola, potato chips. I performed the wedding in the conference room off the main visiting room during visiting hours. I looked through the picture window in that little conference room. I could see the Coca-Cola machine. I could see young kids playing with their fathers. My wife and I were there and my son's bride. Our photographer was an inmate, by the way, with a Polaroid camera. Isn't that what you dream of? So I, my son said, don't, don't ask him what he's doing in prison. Nobody asks you. I said, I'm not going to ask, but I'm going to ask what he charges. So he came in. I said, what's he charge? He said, I charge a dollar a picture, sir. I said, you are my kind of wedding photographer. <laughs> my son's wife, I performed the wedding. It sounds weird, doesn't it, when I talk about it? But on that day, it was the happiest day in the saddest place. My son's wife had gotten her master's degree in Boston. She later won an Emmy in New England. I've held the Emmy statue for film and film editing. She was twice nominated for it. She won it once, like the one you see on TV. I would keep it, but she won't let me. <laughs> they have an 11-year-old daughter, my granddaughter, just turned 11. And I'm a grandfather, so how could I be objective about my own granddaughter? But even if I were 100% objective, she's beautiful. She is beautiful. <clears throat> and every time I hug that little girl, I think, you are a miracle. My son was up for parole after three years. I said, they won't parole you. I was chief justice. It's going to look like an inside job. He paroled him. He was so good on parole, he's supposed to be on parole for years. After about 11 months, the parole officer said, why are you on parole? He said, look, I didn't pick my sentence. He said, I actually enjoy our meetings once a month. Something's wrong with that picture. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to try to get rid of the balance of your parole. My son was pretty excited about that. And I said, well, they won't do that. I'm Chief Justice. They eliminated it. When we went to the parole hearing, my wife and I, 26 inmates were up for parole. The only people I wanted to talk to were my wife and I when we left the prison. Channel 9 sent a camera and they said, do you have anything you want to say? And I remember saying, we're really happy my son will be leaving here and joining his wife. She was working at Dartmouth College. I said, I want to tell you something else. My son's not a bad person. He's now suddenly a good person. He's always been a good person, but he's now well. And those are different things. I know that now. When he and I were driving, he had been home in four years, that Thanksgiving was home. And we were driving to pick up some last minute item and he was in the passenger seat and he was tapping his chest like this. He said, Dad, have you always felt like this? I said, what do you mean like this? He said, good, I mean, Dad, like I feel. I said to him, I probably have. 
I knew I had failed him. He said to me on that trip, Dad, I took an IQ test in the prison. I never told you about that. I said, how did you do on that? He said, well, they told me I was three points below genius on the IQ test. And I was kidding him. I said, you couldn't be a genius? He said, Dad, my ankles were shackled. They were watching me through a two-way mirror. I said, it'd be worth three points. <laughs> I said, OK, you're a genius. I don't know if he is or not, but he's a lot smarter than his father. So why am I bothering you people? Let me make clear to everyone here, I'm not trying to be righteous about mental health awareness. I'm the last guy that could be righteous about it. I wouldn't be here if my son said, Dad, will you stop talking about this? Every time I go out and speak, he says, Dad, I'm really proud of what you're doing. I'm proud of it, too. If you had told me 30 years ago I'd end my professional life doing this, I would have run from the room screaming. It's the most important work I have ever done. I would do this every single day if I could, because I see it now. But I didn't do much when my son was in jail. I, from the bubble, I was hoping nobody read about it. But I knew that couldn't be true, because people would come up to me at gas stations, grocery stores. I didn't know them. They'd say, hey, Judge, how are you doing? You're looking good. I knew what they meant. I said, thank you. I'm feeling much better, too. And my son's doing better. Oh, I didn't want to ask you about him. I said, that's OK. We, we saw alcohol only. That was a problem, but his underlying problem was not alone. My son, by the way, has not had a drop of alcohol in 17 years. He said, Dad, I could spend overnight in a liquor store I wouldn't drink. He said, I'm not that guy anymore. I don't have that tug. But when those people would come up and I'd tell them about my son and he was doing better, every one of those people, perfect strangers to me, would then open up. My mother, my father, my cousin, my sister, my brother, my uncle. I heard about hospitalizations for mental illness. I heard about suicide attempts. Eye-opening. I said to my wife one night, we thought we were alone down there in the Valley of Mental Illness. There were a lot of families marching down there. We just never looked up. But I didn't do anything. About four and a half years ago now, I got a call from a psychologist in Concord, New Hampshire. He's the head of behavioral health at Concord Hospital. He said, John, I have a good friend. Her name is Barbara Van Dalen. She's a psychologist in Maryland. She wants to start a national public awareness campaign on mental illness. She wants to lead it off in New Hampshire. And she wants me, Bill Grund, he said, to chair it. He said, I told her I didn't know enough people, but I knew a guy who knew more people. And his family was across the front pages here a decade ago. Let me call him. He said, will you help us? I'm the guy from the bubble who never talked about it, never did anything. And I said, yes, I'll help. I was surprised. We raised a third of a million dollars for this campaign in no time. First place I visited was Dartmouth Hitchcock. I didn't work there then. I met with the CEO. I had known him for 10 minutes. A year earlier, I'd met him. If he had said to me that morning, John, what are you doing in this campaign? This is ridiculous. I probably would have apologized and left. He gave me a check. Elliott Hospital, where I had been hospitalized, gave me a check. Catholic Medical Center, the New Hampshire Hospital Association, in a return phone call while I was sitting in my car at a mall. I had never met the head of the Hospital Association. I told him what I was doing. He said, John, we'll give you $40,000 for that. Stunning opened my eyes. Everyone who gave me a check had a mental health story somewhere. We launched this campaign on a Monday morning, nonpartisan, nonpolitical awareness campaign on mental illness, in an empty house chamber at our state house in Concord. We have 400 state reps in New Hampshire. You think that's enough? We have 400. And they weren't in session. I know the speaker, he said, John, if you want to use the chamber, you can use the chamber for the announcement. I thought, are you kidding me? Who's going to show up Monday morning? I thought eight people would come. And people who know more about social media than me, which is almost every living person on Earth, they said, don't worry, we'll blast it out, whatever that means. 
And so I went there that day, work day, 10 a.m., thinking, oh, God, this could be embarrassing. 425 people showed up. The Catholic bishop, the Episcopal Church, the Jewish community, our attorney general, three members of the Supreme Court, our entire congressional delegation, our then Governor Maggie Hassan, mayors, CEOs, law enforcement, first responders. It was stunning. It's the most impressive room I've been in in four decades in my state. So I knew there were a lot of other people who were dealing with it too. Barbara Van Dalen, the genius behind the five signs. She was on Time Magazine's 100 list in 2012. But then again, all of us have been on that list at some point in our dreams. She got up that morning and asked this question of the most impressive room I'd seen assembled. If there's anyone in this chamber this morning who's been untouched by mental health issues, yourself, your family, your friends, your extended family, your classmates, your co-workers, your neighbors, if you've ever been touched by it, she said, raise your hand. I had no idea what to expect. I was so new to this. Not one hand went up, meaning every single person had been touched. After it was over, I said, Barbara, how is that possible? I said, John, it's mental illness. She said, my goal is to make the five most common signs of mental illness as well known and as widely known as the signs of a heart attack or stroke. I bet you know a lot of those signs. I do too. She shared these statistics that day, which drive me every day now. She said, half of all mental illness in America begins by age 14. My son was 13. Two thirds by age 23. Last year in our country, over 47,000 people, Fenway Park and then some, took their own lives. I didn't know that. Every 90 minutes, plus or minus every day, including this day, by the way, some brave American veteran, he or she, takes their own life. We lose 20 veterans a day to suicide in America. Yeah, let's not talk about that, that's awkward. Do you know last year in America, more police officers died by suicide than every other cause in the line of duty? I didn't know that. No one ever talks about that. The launch was amazing, and then Barbara Van Dalen flew home to Maryland. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have a manual. So the three of us who were co-chairing it waited to see if anyone would ask us to speak anywhere. In the last 45 months, I've spoken almost 515 times in four states. I've driven over 80,000 miles. I've spoken to well over 110,000 people in rooms large and small. I've been to over 240 schools. I've spoken to 80,000 kids in gyms and auditoriums. It has changed my life and opened my eyes. One of the first places I remember speaking was at a high school outside of Concord, New Hampshire, Pembroke Academy. It was 9 a.m. I went to the gym. Everybody dreams of speaking to 840 high school kids in a gym at 9 a.m. They weren't even on the floor, they were on those comfortable bleachers on both sides. And I was directly under the basketball net on a six inch riser behind a fixed podium with a gooseneck microphone. I remember looking out at those kids that day and I thought, I don't think this is gonna go well. They're probably saying, whose grandfather is this guy and why is he bothering us? But I had to speak, so I spoke just as I've spoken to you. And when I finished speaking, there was dead silence. I mean, dead silence. And the principal, who was then behind me by the wall, stepped up on the little platform. And I thought, maybe they don't know I'm not talking. <laughs> maybe, they couldn't hear, maybe I should wave to them. Let's know. I actually had that video in my head. And after about three seconds of really awkward silence, 840 kids on both sides of that gym stood up and applauded for almost a minute. The principal said, I am shocked by this. I said, you're shocked. I said, they're not applauding me. They don't know me. They'll never see me again. This generation, I love this generation, by the way. I love your generation. You're smarter than I ever was, and you're less judgmental than any generation in the history of the United States. I learn a lot from you. That's what they're applauding. They're tired of it, too. 
One in five kids in that gym had a mental health problem. Family members, parents. My eyes had been open. I wasn't in the bubble anymore. About six weeks later, I went up to central New Hampshire, a bigger high school. Kids were on bleachers on both sides. The bleachers almost hit the ceiling. I was in the middle of the gym floor with a handheld mic. I felt like a quiz master. I said, this is really bad. I got my back to people half the time. And when I finish speaking, they stand up and applaud. Not me. It's this. And after I spoke that day, this kid came out from the bleachers. He was a high school kid. He was like Rob Gronkowski, but he sure looked right to me. He was muscular, had long hair with a baseball cap on backwards. He got about a foot or two from my face, and his eyes were wet. He said to me, can I ask you a favor? I said, sure, what? He said, can I give you a hug? I said, you're 6'3", sure. <laughs> he almost broke me in two. I'm not kidding, you're so strong. Then he told me his own mental health story, and I remember thinking, my God, how are you even in school? I said to him, you're the bravest guy I'm going to meet in my life. Can I return the hug? He said, that'd be great. I'm hugging linebackers in high school gyms I'll never go back to, people I don't know and who don't know me. All they know when they hear me speak is I will not be judging them. That's the only reason. In the last 45 months, and I mean this literally, I have hugged hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids, some as young as the sixth grade, who will come up to me and open up, often with wet eyes and cracking voices. Sometimes they can't even speak. Sometimes they say, thanks for sticking up for kids like me. Sometimes they tell me their stories. Sometimes they say, I'm ashamed of my mental illness. Or my parents are ashamed. Or my father, and sadly, it's always the father. <clears throat> my father doesn't believe in mental illness. He tells me just to get over it. I might have been that guy. I'm not that guy now. I see it now. Nothing will change until we start talking about it, normalizing it, demythologizing it. It's not our personal weakness. It's not a character flaw. It's a health circumstance. My son says to me all the time, Dad, anybody with a mental health problem, I don't care what it is or how old they are, they have two things in common. Number one, they didn't ask for it. That's true. And number two, they don't deserve it. That's true, too. You know what the rest of us do? We make sure they feel badly about it. We stigmatize it. Why do we do that? I was guilty of it myself. But I see it differently now. And when I ask people to give me the good reason, because we've been stigmatizing it forever. And by the way, ignorance and fear are excuses. They're not reasons. But when I ask for the reason, nobody has it. So my question is, why do we tolerate for one more day a stigma that we can't explain or justify? It's immoral, is what it is. Let me close with this. When I go to high schools or middle schools, kids come up. <clears throat> the other day I was at a school. If you remember nothing else I say, please remember this visual. I spoke to 6th, 7th, and 8th grade kids. The principal said, could you stay and go to the lunch room? They come in shifts. Kids have 22 minutes at lunch. And they don't even find it odd. They're eating lunch at 10.30 in the morning. God love them. <laughs> so she said, you can get something to eat, too. I was in the lunchroom two hours and 15 minutes as they all cycled through. I never got to sit down. I never got to sit down. Kids come up and hug you and open to you. Kids have told me they're suicide attempts or they want to kill themselves. What are we doing about that? It's not right. You all know it's not right. And lawyers and law students deal with those problems, too. Doesn't mean you're not bright or good or that you won't be talented or a great lawyer. It has nothing to do with that. One of the things lawyers are about is the truth. What's the honest truth? The honest truth is that law students suffer, too. There's no shame in that. 
It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to pretend you are. <coughs> Lawyers especially should realize that. But when I go to schools, I say to kids, you could change the culture around mental illness if you want. Baby boomers did some great stuff. I'm proud of what we did, but I'm not proud of it on mental illness. We bought into the cone of silence. I told these kids my father was a high school teacher. He's paid on Thursdays. My dad must have felt flush with cash on Thursday nights. My mother and my sister and I would get in my dad's blue Impala. We loved that car. It didn't have seatbelts, but they weren't important, obviously. But it did have an ashtray. They were important. And we'd get to the restaurant, and every table in the restaurant had an ashtray. Some had two. At some point during the night, every table in that restaurant was smoking. My parents loved my sister and myself as they blew smoke on our face. I couldn't wait to be a smoker. Then we'd get back in the blue Impala with no seatbelts and drive two miles home. And I learned as a kid, that's a long trip if you smoke. So one or both my parents would light up and they'd crack the window. You crack the window filter system. I was in the back seat. It didn't seem to work that well from where I was. Then we got to my childhood home. Every room in that house had an ashtray. The bathrooms had ashtrays. My sister used to make ceramic ashtrays in summer camp. They were heirlooms to my mother. You couldn't use those ashtrays. Every coffee table in America had an ashtray. Every law school, every town hall, every doctor's office, every church basement, every automobile, every airplane, every airport. They were everywhere. Have you seen an ashtray recently? What happened? Something changed. If you smoke outside today on the Boston Common, outside, it's a violation of a city ordinance. Unimaginable in my 10-year-old life. We had a black and white television when I was 10 years old. I tell that to kids, and they look at me like, how old is this guy? <laughs> and then just to get even, I say, I only had three stations, and we had rabbit ears. They have no idea what I'm talking about. But we must have survived it. And I tell them some nights I'd be watching the news with my mother on that black and white TV, and I would see African Americans, often dressed like I'm dressed today, marching, holding signs. I didn't know why, obviously, I know now. And some nights I'd see them knocked to the ground like bowling pins, attacked by police dogs, hit with billy clubs. I have a lot of those memories on TV as a kid. I remember saying to my mother, where is that happening? She wasn't proud of it, by the way. It's happening in our own country. If you would ask the 10-year-old version of me, John, do you think in your lifetime we will elect somebody that looks like those people as president of the United States? I would have said, you're out of your mind. I bet you my ashtray that doesn't happen. Thank you, Barack Obama. I was on the Supreme Court at the time. He was running in New Hampshire in 08. I never met him. My mother had passed by then, but her voice remained. It still remains. And she said to me that night when he won, you better be down there, because she would have been. She would have been so proud of this country on that November night. And so I went. I bought an airline ticket. I flew to Washington. This had not happened in 232 years since this nation was founded. It was more rare than the total eclipse of the sun. I wanted to experience that history for myself and for my mother. I stood on the mall that January day, and 1.4 million of my closest friends were there. I was so far from Barack Obama, he looked two inches tall. I said, he looks bigger on television. So I watched it mostly on the Jumbotron, where he was 15 feet tall. And I was thinking a lot of my mother that day and how this had been impossible in her lifetime and how I would have bet you my ashtray, it would have been impossible on my own. In less than a minute, in a voice I'd come to recognize, Barack Hussein Obama, with the black face and the funny name, was sworn in as president of the United States and leader of the free world. Something changed for that to happen. You know who elected Barack Hussein Obama with a black face and a funny name? Young people all across this country who didn't care what color he was, if they even noticed. He inspired them 
like John F. Kennedy inspired me. One of the reasons I love your generation, one of many, is you are color inclusive. We all need to be inclusive when it comes to mental illness, too. If we can eliminate ashtrays from the world I grew up in, if we can elect an African-American president to two terms in the White House from the world I grew up in where racism was tolerated every single day in this country and sometimes applauded, if we can do that, we can do this. We can learn the five basic signs of mental illness. Open your heart, open your mind. You don't need to fly anywhere, buy a ticket anywhere. It's free, but it will change and save lives. I know that now. I've hugged too many kids to know that we need to do more. On the back of this chart is something called react. How do you react if you find the sign? I know how my generation reacted. We didn't see it or pretended we didn't. That didn't help anyone, by the way. I brought these cards. I hope you'll take one. The first one is $1,000. After that, they're free. I hope you hang it somewhere in a refrigerator, on your door, or somewhere. <clears throat> and I hope it leads to discussion with other people. It's about time we had that discussion. You know, I've been doing this now for almost four years. I've driven so many miles. And when you go into schools, particularly middle schools or high schools, they want you there early in the morning. So I drive sometimes at night or in bad weather. I spend a lot of time alone, by the way. And it's pretty easy to get discouraged some days. Like, maybe this doesn't really matter. Maybe it just matters to me. By the way, if my wife ever leaves me, I'm going to propose to Siri. Do you know Siri? I love that woman. I'd be lost in a forest without Siri. But it's easy to get discouraged by it. And then you have experience like I had just a couple of months back. I was at a middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I'm probably the oldest person I've ever seen in a gym. And they were seated on the floor, the comfortable gym floor. I must have looked 19 feet tall from the gym floor. And they listened to me on this. They listened. Not me, it's this. And when I finished speaking, I was standing by the gym exit with the principal. Kids were filing out. A little boy came by, extended his right hand to shake mine. I thought I wouldn't have had that maturity. So he told me his name and his age. He was 13. He was an eighth grader. He said, thanks for coming to our school today and talking about this. I said, oh, you're very welcome. I was happy to come. He said, I want to tell you why I'm thanking you. I said, sure. He said, they tell me here at school that I'm on the spectrum of myself. And your talk here today, he said to me, has changed my whole life. Can I give you a hug? A little eighth grader, and he started hugging me, he was crying, and my eyes watered too. Matter to that kid. Matter to that kid. I hadn't changed his whole life, believe me, I know that. But I'll bet you for the first time in his young life, he, well, he could tell somebody he didn't know what his challenges were without being judged or blamed or shamed. That little kid should be able to hug any one of us, tell any one of us. What are we waiting for? That's not my call. It's up to you. Anyway, thanks. You guys have been great. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> on a chef. <laughs> T.J. Donovan, the man behind me, is the world's most patient person. He's heard me, he's heard me deliver that talk. If he has earplugs, I would understand it. Uh, I never knew you were attorney general until about a year ago, a little more. And he came with me one day with our attorney general, and we spoke at Hanover High School. And he spoke. And then the next time he spoke, by the third time he was speaking, he was opening up in a very personal way, not about him personally, but about people he loves. Uh, 
he is a very impressive human being, and uh, I'm proud he's my friend. And TJ and Will Sudbay, who works in his office, has made Vermont possible for me. They've kicked open a lot of doors here so I can be doing this, and he's a pretty, guy, a pretty busy guy, as you might imagine. So I'm honored that he's here. Uh, anyway, my pleasure to introduce the Attorney General of Vermont, T.J. Donovan. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Great to be at Vermont Law School. I love John Broderick. And as an elected official, there are very few people who I would follow in this world. I'd follow this guy anywhere. Because John Broderick has inspired me. Uh, and he's inspired me to tell the truth. I grew up in Burlington with a big family, and we have mental illness in my family. Never talked about it. We talked about it at home, but we, we always talked about it in the family. And I don't blame my mother or my father or my family just the way it was. I heard John Broderick speak. And then I saw, when we go around to mostly high schools, and we're going to a high school tomorrow morning, and what I see at high schools are kids lining up just to say a few words to John Broderick, oftentimes to ask for that hug and to tell him, them, tell him their story, and oftentimes look for that validation of their pain and their suffering. And we talk about that pain and that suffering. We all can do something about that. By wiping away the stigma and the shame of mental illness. And my personal experience, I get it, uh, it, it affects every single one of us. My sibling, I've gotten called by the police in the middle of the night, made the drive to many drug treatment facilities, been to the hospitals. And if I got called to do it right now, I'd do it again. But we never talked about it. And I think a large part of it was I was ashamed. And the best definition of shame that I've ever heard is that it's a disease that erodes one's soul. And I think that's a pretty good description when you talk about mental illness. And I think about the impact it's had on me and my siblings and my entire family. And it, it's debilitating. And it did take me a few times to talk about this. But I kept seeing folks, these young kids, lining up to see John afterwards. And I know by the virtue of the position I hold, the ability to get out and talk about this, we have an opportunity to do something different. And I agree with John wholeheartedly about your generation. You guys are so much better than us. You're not divided by all the stuff that divides our generation. Mental illness should be on the top of the list that we change the way we deal with in this country and in this state and in this profession that you guys are about to enter. You know, those stats that we heard at the beginning, that's true. And that rate of depression and anxiety and alcoholism and, and drug abuse, it's really high in the legal field. And it's really high, not from lawyers who have been practicing for 30 or 40 years. The most at risk are young lawyers starting off their career. This is a tough profession. And what we have to do is acknowledge that people are suffering. We have to acknowledge that people oftentimes self-medicate because we haven't acknowledged that mental illness is a disease. And we can do something about it. And Vermont Law School can be the place that transforms 
this conversation, to normalize it, to take the stigma away from it, to treat people with respect, to acknowledge their pain, their suffering, and to do something about it, and to make this place a healthier, more safe place for all of us, for our siblings, for our children, for our community, and for ourselves. We need your help. I'm happy to go with John wherever we go. I'll follow him. And sometimes I complain to Will Sudbay about why I'm following John Broderick. <laughs> because it's early and we're going places and we all have stuff to do. But then I see those kids. This is important work. We need your help. We need your leadership. Start it here at Vermont Law School. Change the way we do business when we talk about mental illness in the legal profession. Change the way how we deal with mental illness in our communities, in our schools. Be the thought leaders on this. Speak out, talk about your own personal experience. There's nothing shameful, there's nothing embarrassing about it. We need you, your stories are powerful. Please join John and let's make this world a better place. Thanks for listening. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So before we actually end, and thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time, does anyone have any questions, um, particularly for Mr. Broderick? I know um, Attorney General Donovan has to leave. So um, if anyone has any questions for Mr. Broderick, please let me know. Questions? There's no pressure to have a question. <laughs> All set. Thank you so much. Thank you.